so if this not just if it if it the title does not match what you were expecting, you're in the wrong room, or I'm in the wrong room. But hopefully, uh, it's not the case. So uh, my name is Jean-Georges Perrin. Um, if you didn't take French, or if you're not, if you didn't uh, if you're not French, I also go by JGP quite a bit. Um, I'm a lifetime IBM champion. To make it easy, I'm wearing the same shirt. Same shirt, so you can recognize me more easily. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote a, a few books um, on on data engineering and, and architecture. Um, I'm a yeah, I'm a lifetime IBM champion. So that there's about 30 of them in the world. So it's something that I'm uh, a little bit proud of. Um, and uh, recently, I just published this, this book, which is uh, Implementing Data Mesh. It's about a month old. Uh, and uh, the first smart question gets, gets a book. Right? Um, and uh, the second smart question gets another book. And the third, the third gets a third book. Okay, so, so. And I've got two extra. But uh, OK, so, so, so prepare your smart questions for the end. And I'm the judge of the smart question. I didn't say it was fair, OK? So, OK. So uh, we are going to talk about data contract. And I have a data contract you, you cannot refuse. So from what I've surveyed just before, there's about two, three people that know what data contracts here are. Um, and uh, well, we're going to, det to detail that a little bit more. Who's, who's aware of what a data pipeline is? OK, so a data pipeline is about taking data from a producer here and transform, putting it to a consumer. Okay? And you do that usually with some kind of transformation. Sometimes you do QA. Sometimes you should also be doing documentation as part of that. Okay? Um, documentation, as always in our industry, is a little bit on the poor side of the realization. But I've been lucky enough that in my situation, um, I always found a pretty good documentation for at least five days after the release. Yeah. So, and I wanted to tell you a little bit of a, a, a little story. Um, and uh, it's actually pretty, it's, it's, it's a, by coincidence, my, my son is with me in, uh, in Tokyo. Um, we've got four kids, so it's coincidence that one is here. And once, he recently got a job in a, in a pretty big bank in the US. And once he calls me. So who in this audience has older children, like young teenagers, young adults? OK. How much do they call you? How, how many times do they call you? Not much, right? Or, or just to ask something. So when I saw his, his name on, on, the, on the cell, on my, on my cell phone, I was a little bit worried. OK, what's, what's going on? And basically, he was telling me that he's, um, he's at, his, at his work, his consumers were not happy because they're not getting the data he was expecting. They were expecting. Um, so normally, the pipeline is delivering the data to their system. And this time, it didn't work. And what happened is that the upstream system was down. Right? So I'm pretty sure it never happened to any of you. Okay. That was three, three months in his job, and that's probably the thing you get usually pretty quickly. That's why I told him if you had a data contract at, just after your, after your upstream system and before your downstream system, you would be able to prevent that. You will be able to, well, not prevent the failure, but at least be notified uh, of the problem very, very quickly. So what is a data contract? A data contract for me is an agreement between a data producer, usually one, um, and one to many data consumers. Okay, I see that a little bit like when you've got your cell phone plan, uh, you've got an agreement, you just don't discuss it. Okay, it's it's something it's something you get. 
Here, because it can be a little bit more ad hoc, the consumers can discuss with the producer and can version it. It's also a very important link between the business side of the house and the technology side, which is in charge of the implementation of the data uh, storage. Okay? Third, it's also uh, what I, I, it's also the, I described there as the meta metadata. Okay? So, so it's, not a, it's not a typo. I didn't you know, uh, copy twice my text here. It's really meta metadata. And what I define by meta metadata is the behavior of the data, the data quality rules of your data, uh, your SLAs, etc. So when you've got this three, this three thing in a row, what you actually have is you can decide that your data contract is your source of truth for your metadata. Okay? We, are, we are very often thinking about the source of truth for our data, but here that's a source of truth for your metadata. And when you've got that in mind, well, it's making a lot of things very easily, and you solve quite a few problems. Um, one, one, one problem is, is an upstream schema change. Okay? You've, got, uh, you've got a data producer. It produces ac according to a schema. Uh, if, it, if the producer changes the schema of your data, how do you know that it's actually a change if you don't have a source of truth for your metadata? Okay? Um, so basically, it's all these this, this things we're, we're trying to, uh, to, uh, to apply. It's, bring, it's about bringing uh, data quality. It's about, um, it, it's about guaranteeing SLAs. It's about uh, something which is really close to my, dear to my heart, which is enabling data product thinking. So anyone has heard about data product? All right. So some evangelization to do. Uh, but uh, so data product is really a new concept of shopping like, and data make, made available to you as a product, OK? Which, when you think of AI, there's a lot of things that can actually go into this product. Uh, is anyone from Europe here? Okay. So you're probably familiar with this brand uh, little. Little is a supermarket chain in, in, in Europe. They, they have uh, um, about half a million employees. They're out of Germany. Uh, if you're familiar with Aldi, they're a bit the rival of Aldi. Um, and here, here's David Brunstetter, my, my friend there, who is comparing, uh, who is comparing data constructs to tax returns. Okay, so tax returns is never it's never fun. Okay, so that, that don't get me wrong. But data constructs, I, I'm not there. I'm not here to tell you they're fun. Okay, they're very useful. But the thing is, when I, I like you to to read the last sentence here, which where for us data constructs form the foundation of a living data ownership culture, because you've got data contract, you start to find out who your owners of your data are as well, okay? which is also a challenge in, in our industry. So why am I here today? Well, I used to work at PayPal uh, about, about two years ago. Well, a bit, a bit, yeah, just a, a little bit over two years ago, I think. Uh, and we released at PayPal um, a data contract template. So it was based on our needs at PayPal, and we open sourced it uh, under an Apache 2 license. And when I left PayPal, I said, oh, too bad that nobody's going to really take care of that thing. So I said, before, um, before we throw it away, um, you know, the, the baby, the water, the bath, uh, let's, let's see if there is some interest in that in the industry. And I went to see the Linux Foundation, and we started the BTOL project. And that was in November of uh, 2023. And in less than a year after, we are now in the incubation stage. Um, so that's, that's less than two months ago. And we are, we are we're constantly growing, uh, as you can see here. So uh, we, we, 
what, what you see is that when I, was at when I was at PayPal and we started and we open sourced it, it was very popular very instantly. It's kind of stalling now. Uh, now nowadays, uh, we, we, are, we, we grew pr pretty quickly, uh, especially since we incubated. That's kind of a, that was kind of an accelerator for us. And, but what, what you see is kind of the interesting thing is the number of forks. So for a standard, the number of forks is not really what you're looking after, okay? Because the thing is you don't want your standard to fork too much. Otherwise, what's the point of having a standard? Uh, but um, it, it shows how much of the popularity of it as well. But what is really important is the number of contributors, where we were five people. At, um, at PayPal, so five people from the same company, and now we're 35, which is probably from at least 30 different companies. So why did we do a standard, and why did we do a standard for something so nascent in this industry? Uh, the idea is to boost innovation, okay? We, we saw that there's a lot, a lot of different companies around there that is actually doing data contracts uh, in a way or in a, in a, another. And the problem with that is that it's going to be, it's going to be a, a big mess in a few years when every different company is going to provide a different version of its contract. So you would have to create, you know, translators from one format to another, okay? Uh, imagine a little bit if, if, if HTML was not as standardized as it was, you would have a certain set of browsers that would go to a certain set of uh, websites and it wouldn't wouldn't have been as popularized as that. So that's why we decided to standardize that to benefit so you're focusing on when you're implementing data contracts, you're actually focusing on the innovation, you're not focusing on trying to recreate a format. And it's also about simplifying the integration because what happens is uh, You've got, we're starting to build an ecosystem around that. So more and more people are, are, are proposing solutions around it. And more and more people are actually using it. So which, which here is a little bit of description of the ecosystem. We have, I like to separate in, in three big families, uh, even if there's five bullet points, but three big families. There's the end users, okay? So that's typically when I was talking about little just before, that's one end user. Then you've got software vendors uh, who are kind of creating solutions that are relying or embedding um, the data contracts. And you've got service providers, okay, who are really um, delivering, you know, the consulting companies that are delivering and explaining how to, um, how to use and how to implement data contracts. Then you've got an active user group, and you've got academia, which is actually starting very, very, very slowly around data contracts as well. What, what is important for this, to have the three groups there, the, the three first groups there, is that they are reflected in the TSC. Okay, so the TSC is a technical steering committee, the, um, which is actually governing BTOL and the different standards we're building. And we have about 15 people there, so uh, it's a little bit less than the contributors, makes sense, right? And we have about five, six end users, five, six software developers, and five, five-ish uh, service provider as well. So it gives us, first, it's industry-led, okay? Which means that the industry is leading this, this, this thing. It's not, it's not just one vendor that is pushing a format. It's, in, it's several actors in the industry. It also means that we have various point of views from the different needs. It's not just one software vendor or two software vendors that are aligned and just pushing something on you. It's, it's, it's really um, this regroup. And we are also, um, across different geographies, we have uh, people in Europe, North, of North America, and a very small uh, uh, presence in, in, in APAC. So if you want to join, be, be our guest, okay? So I hope that it is something that you will uh, find interest and in join. 
So, so, what's, so now that we've set up the context a little bit about our, our own data contracts, let's look at what's, what's in a data contract and where it stands in, in, the, uh, in, in the processes. So first, if we look from outside the box, you see that, uh, and that's actually version three, which ver version three has been released uh, about two weeks ago. Um, so you've got people that are contributing to the, to, to, the, to the data contract, so basically contributors, data engineers, data scientists, data product owners, which is basically the owner of the contract, and some automation tools, okay? Uh, and there's a, a few uh, open source uh, tools in this, in this category. When you look at who is consuming uh, the data contract, it could be application monitors, uh, data observability, si uh, notification systems, and whatever tools you guys want to build that will leverage data contracts. And um, you've got also an interaction. So it's a bi-directional way of discussing with enterprise level tools, okay? When you're thinking about data catalogs, um, uh, security, and, uh, uh, and uh, governance as well, okay? So, so that's, where, that's where we sit. Inside the data, the data contract itself, uh, we've added a few sections. We, we used to have eight, and now we are at 11. Um, so that's, that's kind of what you find inside the data contract. Most of that is not required, okay? The idea is really to make you get started, and then you iterate by adding stuff in your data contract. Uh, it's, it's a very living document. So the first thing is the demographics or the fundamentals, where you have the name and, and, and all uh, domain ver version, etc., and a lot of room for description. Okay, so that's that's why that's what the data contracts can actually be uh, very useful at. Then you've got data set and schema, um, which is really something that is a normalized way to describe. Um, a, a data, a data, uh, data records, whether it's relational database or unstructured data. Then you've got data quality. So we, we are not implementing data quality, but we are defining a way for you to describe your data quality rules. Okay, so for example, uh, I don't want nulls in this field. But we know in practice that even if I, in the schema I say that my field is required, over the wire sometimes you, you lose this piece of information, okay? So if we were completely strict in saying, well, it's a required field, I want 100% of it being filled, well, your, your pipeline may break very often. But if you accept a tolerance of 1%, this is a parameter you can put in your data quality rule. Okay? Um, and, that's, and we have a standardized way to do it. We've got pricing. So if you're in a larger organization, um, you can do showback or, or, or billback or payback on, the, on your costs. Okay, I'm a producer of my of information. My boss has asked me to share it with some consumers. I'm really not incentivized in sharing it, right? The thing is, just to please my boss, really. Uh, and so, if there's not a KPI associated in my work for that or, or, or part of my OKRs, well, I'm not super motivated in doing it. But if I can change. If I can change the system in saying I'm actually selling the data to my consumers, even if it's virtual internal currencies or whatever inside the company, I can actually show that as value associated to my data. The next thing is roles. Um, you know, one thing when, when I was at PayPal and other companies is that it's very difficult to find, da to find data. And when you find the data, You've got, oh, I found the growl, and I've, I've, got, I've got the data I want there. But then you've got to do another set of exercises to find, how do I get access to this data? What's the roles do I require? And that's also part of the data contract. 
Same thing for security, service, uh, and, and, and level security. Regarding service level agreement, I work in a lot of companies where you, you know, you know what SLAs are, right? right? And in, in, in cloud computing, on SaaS application, a lot of people are just saying, okay, that's a number of lines my system is available. But when you're thinking about data, there's a lot more criteria to define as service levels, uh, objectives, and indicators for, for your data. Like, when was it made available? What time, what, what's the delay between the production and the availability of it, etc. So a lot, of, a lot of companies I've either consulted or worked with do not have a clear vision of, that, that, of, of those SLAs. The data is coming when it's coming. That's not an acceptable answer in most cases. Um, SLAs here can actually um, define that, that easily. The infrastructure is a, new, uh, is a new thing we've added in version three, where once you define the infrastructure you want in your data contract, why not give it to a Terraform or something else so it can provision, um, it can provision directly the, the, um, the information or give it to an application that knows where the data is and eventually if the data changes location, it, it's, um, the application is aware of it. Business rule is something we're working on which is going to be available in 3.1. And um, custom properties is just to ensure that you can have extensibility for your own needs as you go. So how do we implement data contract? It's a YAML file. We choose YAML over whatever format because uh, it's usually human and computer readable. I say readable, okay? I'm not expecting engineers, well, so, people outside of being engineers to do YAML. Uh, it's not going to be your product owner doing YAML, but uh, and that's where the tooling is important as well. But it's easy to understand. Uh, it's, uh, there's, it's language agnostic, okay, well, like a lot of different f format these days, but I'm pretty sure you can even uh, find a YAML parser in Perl. I haven't looked. I used that in several conferences. I'm pretty sure someone is going to tell me once that they found it. Okay. Um, and if you're not familiar, it's very it's it's a variation of uh, of JSON basically. So that's a, that's that's a first example of a data contract. Here you see that it's describing my schema. It's a segment of my schema where I've got something which its name is TBL. Very originally, it's a table. Okay. Um, and uh, you see, you see that it is. Uh, you see its columns here. Okay, so you've got the business name, you've got the logical type, you've got the physical type, a lot of descriptions. You see, va you see example values. See, you see also a lot of descriptions there. So that's that's really a very basic example of what you can put in a data contract. All normalized. Now, uh, if I have a, a little bit more, a little bit more complex example here, where you see that there's a logical type and uh, a physical type. Anyone doing Kafka here? Okay, there's there's a similar notion in Kafka. Um, wh wh why we wanted to put that in the data contract is, for example, for a business user, knowing that it's a string, that's perfectly enough. It's knowing that it's implemented in a MySQL database as a varchar 32, that's probably not really interesting information for him. Okay, so um, so that's why having just this uh, um, as as that is is going to be uh, is going to be very interesting. And you're also going to be able to monitor more closely each schema changes uh, if your my varchar 32 becomes a varchar 15. Okay, which is not going to break anything. The second block here, you see authoritative definitions. Uh, the idea of authoritative definition is that we, uh, uh, we can track their 
external definitions. Okay, for example, here there's a reference implementation that is in GitHub, and there's also a, a link to a Colibra. Okay, so Colibra is a big t tool set available for not open source, but uh, available for enterprise for data governance. A lot of people put a lot of information in Colibra, so why not leverage it uh, instead of trying to uh, just copy it or something? Okay, so that's that's the idea there. Then. Uh, you have uh, teams, okay? So um, that's one. Of, that's one of a joke. It's a very, very thin percentage of the population that gets the joke here. Um, and if I tell it, it's not a joke anymore. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so. Um, this guy, C. Eastwood, was, was not playing very nice, and uh, it was a little bit dirty, and he was replaced by someone called Jay Wayne, okay? So this is, this is a kind of a tra tracking, you can have this kind of tribal knowledge, okay, I've been told it's, it's still politically correct to say tribal knowledge, uh, that you keep in your enterprises and that you can, um, that you lose over time, okay? Here, in this situation, you can keep track of it. And you can tri t keep track of it not only for data product owners, DPOs, but any stakeholders or any team member, you want to keep that. Your data architects, your lead data engineers, um, your, um, your uh, uh, lead engineers, whatever, okay? You, you've, got, you've, got all, you've got all this uh, you, can, uh, you can track there. And, and here, the two last examples uh, is really about SLAs. Okay, so, so here, in, in this situation, I can measure, uh, you see my SLA properties here. My first one here, outside of the box, is latency. That means that in this situation, I have a latency of four days between my data being um, produced and being available to my analyst, for example. And I can measure it on, uh, you see here, this tab one dot TX in a rough, rough date, that's a column on which I can measure it, okay? So it's very, it's very useful, very centralized. And, and then you, that, that's kind of very operational as an SLA, but you also have more documentation-oriented SLAs like general availability, end of support, and end of life. Okay, this is, this is typically things you see with software, right? You've got, uh, w when you're thinking about a software product, you should have this value when you buy it or when you install it or even if it's when it's open source, part of the life cycle of the software, right? So why not data? Okay, so that's when I was talking that you think you start to think to, to be able to think uh, data as a product. This is the kind of criteria you can actually use. And then you've got retention. Uh, for example, well, how, how long how long am I keeping my data? Okay, um, frequency, time of availability, etc. I leave that's all that is in your in your. Um, in your deck online. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster. So when you're actually, when, you, when you're thinking about uh, those service level indicators, which I just talked about, there's about, we've identified 12 of them, okay? And when you combine that with your data quality criteria, there are seven according to the uh, EDM council. Well, together we've combined that and we call this uh, data QoS or data quality of service. Okay, quality of service is a term we are using a lot of networking, uh, but why not uh, extend it to uh, quality of service? So let's let's just look a little bit about AI and how it actually relates to AI. So, um, so we we've got. Um, okay, we've got two, two levels of AI, but this is going to be mostly enterprise AI. And when you're thinking about training a model, I'm not going to explain you how to train a model, that's probably not the right setting. Uh, but you've got training data, okay, and you've got new data, okay? So the idea is 
when you're, you, it's data, okay, right? You need, you need, you need data to, to do that. But do you trust this data? How do you guarantee that this data is actually the data you're expecting in the form you're expecting if you don't have a contract that guarantees it? Okay, so that's a big, that's a very big and important part of that. The second use case where it's very interesting for, uh, for AI is when you're actually extending your model. Okay, when you're thinking about uh, uh, Way when you want to, when you're using a standard model out of the box, okay, you go to uh, hugging faces, you download the model, and you just want to add your own data to it. You either use uh, a RAG, okay, via, via a vector database, or you can use Instruct Lab, um, which, is, which is a Red Hat product, which is open source. Uh, but basically, it always comes, and it, I mean, it's always using something which is data. Right? So if same thing here, if your data is not being proofed when you bring it to your model or the extension of your model, well, what you're getting out of it is probably not very of very good quality. Okay? So when you're when you're comparing about AI, um, um, so so this is this is just the four level of the AI ladders uh, that was um, uh, shared by uh, Rob Thomas a few years ago, uh, the chief sales officer from IBM. But basically, you start by collecting data. Then you start organizing it. Then you analyze. And then you infuse, OK? So when we're thinking about creating a model, it's really in the analyze part. But before that, you really need to be able to make sure that your data you collect, okay, and when you organize it, that there's a standard way of doing it. Once more, data contracts are here to help. Right? And, I, and when I see that, I can, and, and being in Tokyo for that, I can, I can only think of that. But that's me. Probably thousands of copyright infringement. Um, okay, we are open source, we are a bit more li liberal. Okay, so demo. Uh, unfortunately, we are really out of, of the, uh, short on time, but uh, I, I have a, so you can, you can click this, you can uh, get a copy of this, this QR code um, or this URL, an easy one to remember, and you will get to Data Contract CLI. And Data Contract CLI is done by uh, this guy and, and a few other, uh, here you're on, you can see, you, he's playing right now. Here you can see with, with the data contract CLI. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's testing, here he's, te he's testing a data contract. So his data contract is, uh, looks like most of the things are, pass are passing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then you can start modifying, you can start playing with the data contract, enriching it, changing types, see what happens when you, when, when you do that, okay? Um, so so uh, it's, it's very, uh, see, there's, a, there's an issue, there's a following errors, okay, so he's got to do, to have to change something, et cetera. So, so uh, and, uh, I didn't do a live demo because first it's very dangerous, but the thing is it's also that uh, ver that's on version three of ODCS, which is like two, year, two, we two weeks old, and, and Joran and his team actually uh, just finished that, uh, the implementation. And it's, of course, open source. Okay, um, let's, let's conclude. Um, so I, I, I've got also these little books uh, because, uh, because they, they are, they're, they're fun, okay? So in the, in the country of mangas, it's not really mangas, but, but they are kind of a little bit manga-ish. Uh, and uh, the idea, I, I started that to explain to kids what I was working on. And finally, what I re realized is that uh, people are actually uh, using them to explain to their VPs and directors uh, what data mesh and data contracts are, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm, sh it's, I'm not putting that as, as, well, a little bit as an advertisement, to be honest, but the thing is, uh, more than half of the profits of, of those books are actually going to two charities, uh, which is Girls Develop, um, Girls, g sorry, Girls, uh, Girls, Girls Who Code and Black Girl Code in the U.S. And, uh, I think, I think we don't have enough uh, women in our industry. 
Uh, I think that, uh, so basically, we are at an open source con uh, conference. You've heard a little bit about open standard as well. We are an open standard. We don't have any code, okay? Uh, even data contract CLI, that's not ours. It's so, so far. Uh, but I think that for me, open standards are even more important than, than, than open source in a way, because that's a one way thing to actually be able to, 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 uh, to build together stuff on top of it. Um, one thing is, Iterate, okay, when you're starting with, with data contracts, you, I, you're starting with a very basic version and you're going to iterate over it, okay, so keep that in mind. And uh, as key takeaways, um, so it's always about trust. Um, I, I, yep. I forgot. I forgot her name. Uh, we had a speaker this morning talk, talk, talking about AI and trustworthiness. This is really about trust. Okay, this is about building the trust for your data, uh, and and I think this is something that is um, that is really 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 important. So next step, very easily, is please join Beetle. Okay, of course it's a it's a Linux Foundation project. Uh, join us, beetle.io. We've got a link to our Slack at the at the bottom. We've got plenty of resources there, and I made it easy for you. So with that, th thank you very much, uh, and uh, I have books. You have questions. Okay, we've got a first candidate. Be, uh, be kind, because it might not be a smart question. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, well, first, uh, it was Dirty Harry, right? Yes. So, okay. Thank you. For those who don't get it, doesn't matter. <laughs> so, it's nerd jokes. So, um, I'm, I'm curious because um, when you opened the conversation, you said, okay, do you know anything about data contracts? First thing that came to my head was like a uh, blockchain. Okay. Right? And blockchain, and I'm driving the analogy, please help me out here. Uh, so, then you mentioned here, like, a, you have data when you want to train your models, and that's a fact. And most of the time, there's a cost with that data, the, mm -hmm. the cost of truth. Because I don't know if I want to invest uh, time, resources, and later find out that my investment didn't pay off, right? So uh, when, when we're talking about scaling or sending these uh, uh, solutions into production, I need to talk, uh, let's say, with business, with investors. Right? Do you think uh, these standards could, could help us to bring these kind of investment uh, conversations? Yeah, I was, you know, uh, I, 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 I've done a, an, another set of talks on, on data quality, okay? And, and data quality is one of the, is one of the thing is, you know you're investing in data quality, you don't know how much you're getting out of it, right? Uh, and one example I, I often use is, you know, when, when, um, uh, when Hubble was a little blind, and uh, they, uh, they had to start a, a, a space shuttle mission to add a lens on top of Hubble and fix it, that was $200 million to add glasses to Hubble, okay? So, so this is, the, and it was a data quality problem because it was a two nanometer error due to a conversion from imperial to metric system, okay? So, so, so what, what I'm saying by that is, I'm not trying, to tell you the fear of something. But the thing is, when you're, when you're thinking about bringing data to a model or to a trainer, and it's going to take you months of that, and then you don't know the quality of the data, it's probably worth having a data, and especially when data is kind of in movement, when you, when you have a, 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 a rag to be filled or something like that. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a very small investment uh, to, to make sure, because otherwise, you know, you can just start your trainer and three months later you're in and you just don't know and you spend more and more money, okay? So, so when, when, I was, when you're looking at, the, um, at, the sli at this slide here, uh, you know, when, when, when I started doing ML, it was a matter of seconds and very little cost in dollars that everything could run on my Mac just to, to train the model. For deep learning, yeah, a little bit more hours, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, just not a lot more. But when you're doing LLMs, it's, it's, it's costing a fortune, okay? So, so, so if you're, if you're in, this, in this scenario, I think being preventive and having data contracts and the tooling next to it 
is is a no-brainer. Yeah. We'll have to double click later on that. Thank you very much. Yep. That's a that was a smart question. Okay. So. Oh. <laughs> just just to set the bar. <laughs> Hey, uh, from an uh, enterprise perspective, when you try to facilitate that company stakeholders to establish that data contract, how you, what is your best practices to, not, uh, to support them to not kill themselves between themselves during that process? <coughs> well, um, as I said, I was, I, I'm in Tokyo with, with, with my son, and he really wanted to, ma to watch a sumo match. So I think it's fun to see as well, you know, a little blood between departments. But, uh, uh, but, but more seriously, the thing is uh, you, um, you've got a framework. It gives you a framework, okay? Often when I'm seeing disagreement between departments and business units and things like that, and that's going to be the last question. I've got the red flag already. Uh, um, you, uh, it's a problem of communication. It's, I don't, I, oh, I didn't know I had to ask you the questions, okay? Oh, what, what do you mean that I want the data five minutes after it's being created, okay? Hey, my, my data retention in my source system is six months, and now you're telling me you want to keep it for three years? Okay, this is very basic questions. Okay, but when you go through the list of of of, uh, of SLAs we've defined, uh, you, this is a discussion you're having. Okay, so the thing is, usually the discussion is the discussion itself is not hurting. It's when when it hurts, it's at the end when you've got the project which is delivered and you start realizing. Oh, you wanted a six months retention. Uh, you wanted a three-year retention period. <laughs> so it means that I'm going to have to install this data warehouse in the middle, blah blah blah, etc. Okay, that's where it hurts. Uh, before it doesn't really hurt. Okay, then you discuss budget and things like that. So, so I think it's really a framework for discussion, which is always good. All right. So I got clearly the red thing. Okay. So, so I still have. I still have. A few books, but we can take it offline just there, so so the next speaker can set up. Uh, thank you very much for for coming. Thank you.